Hello and welcome to episode 24 of the Edinburgh Northern Cockle Cast, back after a very brief hiatus. Uh, it's a pleasure to be joined by this guest, a, a real Northern stalwart. Uh, many of our current players will recognise him as a keen member of the, the Tuesday Evening Running Club and a perpetual presence on the touchline for all our home and away games, ensuring the referee is made aware of the dubious calls made against his team. Uh, so... <laughs> Of course, he was once a standout second row for the club uh, and the president from the year of my birth until the year of my co-host's birth. Uh, he is none other than Peter Bonington. Good evening, Pete. How are we doing? Hi, guys. Doing fine. Thank you. And you? Yes. <laughs> Very good. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excellent. Um, what, are you, uh, what are you drinking with us this evening, Peter? I'm drinking a rather acceptable cheeky Merlot. Showing my age, I suspect. Or class. I think we'll go with, go with class. Okay, very um, kind of you. Uh, what are you drinking, Jason? Uh, so I've got a, a brew dog dead pony, dead pony club. Uh, one I've not tried yet. Excellent. And I've gone for I've gone for a, a brew dog um, punk AF again because it's a Wednesday night, so it's alcohol free. Yeah. Good choice. And, <coughs> Uh, so firstly then, Peter, tell us about your lockdown situation and how you're managing with it. We're doing fine. Um, we, we were in Australia at the end of February and came back the end of March to what you guys have got now. But we had to self-isolate for 14, 14 days, which was obviously a bit of a strain. But yeah, we're into the swing of it now. The local pub's open, which is grand. And um, we're beginning to get, see some sport on the telly, and it looks as if rugby is maybe even going to be starting up in the next couple of months or so, I guess. Yeah, it looks like so, it. All to look forward to, really, you know. Exactly. I think We're trying Michael... to keep safe, obviously. <laughs> true. I think Michael's local pub's opening very soon. Is that true, Michael? Uh, I've been told it's the 1st of August. Um, so I'll be I'll be first for the doors at four o'clock. Um, <laughs> after I think it's the longest I've actually not drank in there in about ten years, which is quite yeah, it's a bit dabbing. Um, uh, my pub's got a beer garden, so we were in a bit earlier, you know. Oh, okay. Mm. What's your, What's your local pub? The Stable Bar in oh. Morton Hall. Oh, that's wonderful! It's actually one of my, my one of my favourite um, non Southside pubs. Um, yeah, good hostel room. Yeah. Yeah, on the food's the food's really good as well. Food's good, um, yeah. <clears throat> um, the wee back room I quite like it a lot. I've never actually been allowed to sit in their main bar area because it's always so busy on a Sunday. But um, yeah, it's an excellent spot. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, um, Peter? You know your, your backstory, where you're from, what? You, well, you yeah, <clears throat> I'm raised, born and raised in Musselburgh. Lovely. Musselburgh isn't the end of the earth, but you can see it from there. It's uh, an interesting wee town, um, and um, had many a uh, happy day down there. Played for uh, Musselburgh Grammar School, and then eventually moved on to Musselburgh Rugby Club. Okay. Played for Musselburgh Rugby Club for 25 seasons. No way. And then it all happened. I was training myself in Inverleith Park, and some guys approached me and said, listen, do you want to run about with us? And I said, well, yeah, okay. So the next thing I knew, I got asked to take part in a trials game the following Saturday. And the next thing I knew, the following Saturday, I was playing against uh, Turnhouse, I think it was. Maybe not Turnhouse, maybe Ferranti. And that was it. Started then, and uh, oh, by the way, you might like this. Oh wow! That's this is the, my very first game for Edinburgh Northern, 1981-82 season. You didn't mention you didn't meddle with me, lads, huh? <laughs> you definitely look a bit British in that. Um. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm certainly impressed. I wish my facial growth wasn't as intimidating. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so, um, yeah, that was it. Joined Northern in 81, 82. Didn't look back, as they say. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, loads of highlights, loads of fun and games. Most enjoyable. Played for Northern until, I think, well, I didn't join Northern until I was 40. Really? And I think I had nine or 10 seasons with them playing. Excellent. So, a lot of fun. Played far too late. There you are. I've got another good. funny for you here. Go for it. I had my very last game of rugby when I was 60. <laughs> Looks That's me jumping for the ball in the dad's team against the boys' team under 16s, Royal High School, under 16s, dads <laughs> against boys. Oh, wow. <clears throat> Very last game of rugby. That must have been a fun one to play. Let me tell you, I'm paying for it now. My body's just about knackered. <laughs> right enough. <laughs> I, think, I think at 32, mine's is going to give up fairly soon. Uh, so, Peter, <laughs> you, you talked about your time at Musselburgh. Um, would you always have been a second row then? Uh, what um, well, play? yeah, I, I basically, yeah, I was second row. Mind you, then when I played for Musselboro, it was uh, obviously a, a higher standard than Northern. Um, and I was 15, 15 a bit stone. So I was fairly bulky, so the second row was fine. Having said that, in these days, Nobody lifted you up to catch the ball in the line out. <laughs> you had you had to do it yourself. <clears throat> right, true. And there was all sorts of ploys, you know, <laughs> for getting get keeping the opposition down, finger in the opposition's pocket, standing on his toes, that sort of thing. Great fun. Exactly. So some of your peers have uh, mentioned you were quite a handy player then. Would there have been any representative rugby in your time or, or sort of trophies that I you played, won? Um, yeah, I played, when I played for Musselburgh, I, I was selected for uh, East Lothian District. Very good. For a few games for East Lothian District, as it was then, you know. Don't think it, I don't think it's around now, but there you go. But that's the only representative rugby uh, I was hoping I'd be employed, uh, employed, hoping I'd be able to get a game for Edinburgh District. I think Breakin and all them aspired to that, but it never happened. But there you go. And Can't win them all. Uh, probably jump on Michael's question here, but what, did you say it was 1981 you joined Northern? Yeah, the season, the season was the 81-82 season. Yeah. Excellent. So... Excellent. When when was the when was the big league victory then that took us into? Uh, that was probably the one that Joe Smith uh, mentioned in his uh, discourse. Yeah. Mentioned is um, one word for it. <clears throat> uh, and um, that would probably be, yeah, one of my outstanding memories as well. The same game. It was um, a bit towsy. Murrayfield, it was against Murrayfield. They were unbeaten in the league. We were unbeaten in the league. I think it was the following season that this was the big game. Anyway, the, um, they could take care of themselves, but we had a few guys that could take care of themselves as well. So we won the day, but there was a... a <laughs> I keep telling about the, the biggest funny that came out of that game was we had a winger called Donald Hume. Donald was one of these um, real cream boys in the backs, you know. And um, Northern were, it was 6-6 six, six at the time, and Northern were awarded a penalty. And um, Pete Haddon of the Haddon brothers fame stepped up to take this penalty. But before he took the penalty, Donald Hume, Hume went round all the forwards and said, listen, if this goes over the bar, don't make a sound. Just turn your backs and walk back to the centre line. I said, OK, fine. So he takes the kick, it sails over the bar, 
Hume goes berserk, running around everybody. Look at that, you wanker, flew here, yeah, look at that, look at what he's just done. Ho, 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 how do you like that? And looked at him, I thought, what the f <laughs> what, a, what a man. I suppose you all left him out to dry then, and <laughs> just walked away. <laughs> Crazy. <clears throat> Excellent. So that's obviously that's obviously one particular highlight from your, your playing time with Northern. Have you got any other kind of favourite, you know, games or tournaments? Um, or possibly though you were a second row of sevens tournaments, dare I say? I was never yeah. a sevens player. Far too big a pitch <laughs> for me. No, no, never a sevens <clears throat> player. We had a lot of highlights. Yeah, I mean, I remember touring. We went over to, we used to go to Dublin every two years, playing against... Um, uh, an outfit called Sea Point. Their trophy is still in the club. That's yeah. the toilet pan lid, you know. It's the toilet one, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and we played out our skins. They were a really good side, and and I think now they're well up in the in the leagues, you know. But we got a six six draw, and we did really well considering half of us were pissed as farts, you know, um, being on tour. Mm. But there was a few highlights. Another one, I've got a wee photo here again for you. A highlight for me was not from a playing career, but from my uh, presidency of the club. And it was this. Yeah. Uh, Finley Calder, is it? At the that's right. That's the Stuart Melville victorious seven aside uh, winners at Twickenham. And Finlay bought, brought the whole side to play in the Northern Sims. And guess what? They won it. <laughs> Surprising. And that was, that was a, a real highlight as well. Oh, very good. And another other highlights would be being president of the club was a real honour. Thoroughly enjoyed that. Being made an honorary life member, that was a big highlight as well. Quite right. So loads of things like that, you know. Uh, so, so back to your time on the pitch then, uh, is there any tries of yours that might stand out? Or no, I wasn't, wasn't a great try scorer. So nothing, no, nothing like that. Left that to the people like uh, Brechin, who once he got the ball, it got stuck up his jumper and that was it. Nobody else saw it. Well, the Brill Cream boys, the Brill Cream boys in the back, so we usually left it to them as well, you know. Excellent. <laughs> um, we'll move on to your kind of your, I, we always ask people about their favourite positional combinations. Um, but I think, given obviously you're of a different generation to ourselves, we'll let you pick out with uh, just the second row. Um, do you have a couple of players who you played with alongside um, at your time at the club who you kind of really stand out for you as your favourite Northerners to play with? Well, yeah, there was there was one there was one or two. There was um, um, I've mentioned them already. Ian Brechin, I mean, Brechin. Oh, he might have put on a pound or two now. Ian Brechin was a bloody good player. Let me tell you, a really good player. <laughs> but there was another guy I love playing with. You won't, you guys won't know him, but called Dougie Henderson. Dougie Dougie Henderson played centre or winger. Dougie was the hardest man you've ever come across in your life. And there was this particular game where the winger was running down the touchline. Dougie went across and he hit this guy. He was on the first 15 pitch with the trees down the side. And the trees were nearer the pitch at that time. He hit this guy and they disappeared into the, into the trees. Dougie got up, back onto the pitch. That's fine. This guy never got back up. <laughs> So I, I like playing with Dougie and Brechin, yeah, he was he's a good guy to play with. But also in this we had a we had a great scrum at the time. And having a guy like Mike Mike Cuthbert, I played with him in the second row. And he was a solid bulwark, you know. I mean he he nobody pushed us back off the ball, you know. It was pretty good. We were pretty pretty decent at that time, yeah. So yeah, one or two of them. <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah, looking at some of them, you wouldn't believe that uh, they ever moved very fast. Uh, 
don't know. <clears throat> I've I've seen I've seen Breakin's eyes when he's angry about something, and I can I can I wouldn't want to be playing against that if I'm honest. That right. Well, as I say, when you know we came up against some towsy sides, but um, nobody put one over on us. You know, we're a lot of lot of good scuffy hard guys. You know. So there you go. Yeah, maybe I was, I was just going to ask. Obviously, you've been, um, you've watched a lot of the games that um, you know since your retirement. What are the differences that you see between the game that you played, um, you know, back in the eighties and the game now in terms of the club level? You know, is it is it different? Is uh, it yeah, different? it is different. I did coach the club for a, a number of years, but really, the the difference I can see now is um, the speed of play, you know, even even amongst the forwards. And the, the style of play is obviously different from when I played. You know, there was there was no um you just when you got down in the scrum you just banged together. You know, it was there was no uh, calling out from the referee or anything. And so you're always trying to put one over on the other scrum. And so the whole pace of the game really has changed. But it but it is quicker, it is faster. Um, and that is very no- noticeable for guys like me, anyway. You know, <clears throat> I wouldn't always have thought we were <clears throat> that fast, Michael. But I'm certainly not. <laughs> must um, be talking about something else. No, I've noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, um, Peter, obviously, as a player, coach, president, honorary life member, you've seen seen it all at Northern. So, what then would you say is Northern's unique selling point? Friendliness, friendliness, definitely friendliness. Um, I mean, there was when when I played for Musselburgh. If you weren't playing for the first fifteen, you weren't in the clique. You know what I mean? See, the, the first fifteen was a kind of clique, cliqueish sort of club on its own, if you like. When I joined Northern. Didn't matter if a guy played for the fifths as we had then, or the seconds, or the thirds, or the firsts. He was accepted into the club, and he he went on piss ups with you. He did whatever anybody else was doing. So that was the the, the if you like unique selling point was the uh, camaraderie and friendliness of the club. Quite right. Yeah, I think something we work hard to maintain that, isn't it? That there's no real um, divide across the club, one one squad, one club sort of thing. Good, keep it going. We try to, we try to. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you've actually led quite well into the next question. But, um, kind of one of the things at Cranmer is nothing builds it quite like a good night out. Um, do you have any particular favourites? You kind of your favourite nights out of the club, or favourite events from your time? Oh God, we had hundreds of them, but we used to we used to always. If it was somebody was getting married, right? We we played the game, went back to the dressing room, and all his clothes had been taken away. And in place of his his clothes, there was like a fancy dress costume, like a tutu, ballet dancer's costume or something like that. And then we headed up the Royal Mile and went on a pub crawl in every pub we could find up the Royal Mile. And we had some carry-ons, I tell you. <laughs> some carry-ons. A few memorable ones. <laughs> where was it um where was it you drank back in back when you were playing during your presidential days? Has it always been um bunker? well yeah, there was there was there was various we didn't have the um kind of sponsorship, all the sponsorship deals that you guys have, have got now. Mm-hmm. But um, Kay's Bar, yeah, Kay's Bar was a favourite. There was a there was a, another bar down the bottom of Dundas Street called Clark's Bar, which was quite a favourite as well. Mm-hmm. But, the, but the club, you know, we, we tended to kind of stay in the club for long enough and then maybe head off somewhere else. But, um, yeah, there was some memorable night down the uh, down the Royal Mile or up the Royal Mile, anyway. But I think um, you guys might not might might not be too bored to hear um, my most em- embarrassing 
story um, is not actually connected with the club as such, but I'll relate it to you anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I used to be on the after dinner speaking circuit. Yes, Mike told us this actually. Uh, yeah. So anyway, I'll try and keep this short. I got invited to speak, speak at the Peebles Rugby Club dinner, right? Down in Peebles. So that was fine. They were going to put me up. So drove down, fine, checked in, walked along to Peebles Rugby Club. I don't know if you know the place, but it doesn't matter. You go in a kind of stair, it's a strange place in the middle of Peebles. Anyway, I got met by the president and greeted warmly and taken into a private room where the top table guests were assembled, right? In the top table, amongst the top table guests were two women, all frocked up, looking glam. And I turned to the president and said, listen, um, <clears throat> I'm making a speech tonight, and I says, some of the stuff in my speech is a bit um, <clears throat> risky, to put it mildly. He says, oh, don't worry too much about it. I says, who are the women anyway? He says, well, one is the club secretary, and the other one is the club treasurer, and they're both at the top table, and the good news from your point of view is you're sitting next to one of them. <laughs> so, oh, for Christ's sake. You know? So anyway, there's a couple of drinks and we got clapped in and we took our uh, places at the top table and right enough there's the president sitting there there's the captain there's me and there's one of the females and then somebody else and another female and i turned to the captain and says listen i says i'm worried about this speech i've got because there's a bit of filth in here you know he says oh don't worry about it take your time from me okay I says, oh, okay then. So anyway, the president started the meal. President stands up, welcomes everybody, calls on the captain for his speech, you see. So the captain stands up and he says, Mr. President, um, distinguished guests, gentlemen, and the two split arses at the top table. Well, I didn't know where to look. And she's sitting right next to me, one of them. So, it doesn't matter what I say now, <laughs> it's, it's going to go down no problem at, at all. <laughs> True story. True story. Excellent. Oh boy, that was some night. <laughs> <laughs> Came on from that point. <laughs> I, I, was, I was never so embarrassed in all my life, but there you go. And they didn't turn my hair, by the way, the two women. <laughs> You knew their place, maybe. Funny story, though, eh? Definitely. Uh, so you mentioned then uh, trips over to Dublin. Obviously, we're, we're renowned touring club even before your time. Uh, were there any other tours then that, that, that you remember, um, maybe standout ones? No, we just, that was, that was what we did. You know, okay. just every two years we went to Dublin. Simple yeah. as that. And yeah. the, the, year, the years in between, Seapoint came over and played us, you know? I think eventually the, the competition between the two clubs kind of frittered away a bit, you know, um, mainly because they, they became really too, well, one of the reasons possibly was we lost a few of the contacts, but the other reason was they became too good for us. I mean, they are, done. Uh, Seapoint or Indon Leary are a big club, you know. Certainly, yeah. Club. Um, but there, there's obviously tales from Dublin then. Um, we, we missed your question on, on jewels, uh, would you like Oh to? yeah, well, the, when we went over to, I think it was season, I think it was season 81, 82, or maybe 82, 83. Anyway, we went over to Dublin and we decided to have a knockback competition. Okay. So you all were charged to be able to approach some young lady and make improper suggestions to her Tour, and you never know if she refused you, you got a knockback, and that was a point score. Okay, yeah. so there was various lies told about you know, approach this lassie. However, the place we stayed in Dunleary had a wedding on one of the nights we were staying there, and uh, one of the guys got a knockback 
know, and he got extra points because he approached the bride and asked, asked her if a wee, wee bit thing would be in order. <laughs> and that, that gained a few points. But the highlight was with Joe Smith at Dublin Airport, he approached a nun, serenaded her with a song, and asked her if uh, it was out of the question. And that, that, won, that won the knockback competition. <laughs> Crazy, crazy. He's always been very gallus, eh? Oh, mind you, he had the blarney, you know. She did. She wasn't too upset, I don't think. I don't think. I think we actually have a listener question in from from said northerner Michael. If you want to take it. We, we do indeed. Um, he's returned you the favour, Peter. Um, so this is from At Old Age Disney Come Itself. Um, and he's asked, um, or sorry, he tells us your party piece was the tattooed lady and suggests you could finish up with a rendition for our viewers. You want me to do that now? Is this, I, I don't, I, I've got no idea what it is. It's just Joe suggested it. Oh, it's a song. Oh, yeah. Go for it. I took my wife for a holiday and we went to gay party. I'm sorry that I took her now. The reason's plain, you'll see. We met a lady where we stayed. She was tattooed from head to toe. She had maps of every place on earth. She promised she would show. She promised to show me the maps and she was a saucy kid. She promised to show me the maps, and what is more, she did. She had Holland on her back, and Denmark there as well. Between her shoulder blades ran the Panama Canal. She had the States on her right knee, and on her left, there was a map of Germany. Her ankles were all grease, and her thighs were Japanese. And on one hip, she had the Isle of Skye. Just then I saw the wife, so to save a lot of strife, I let the rest of the world Go by. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, have to, this. I have to tell you that during the course of that song, I used to take my clothes off. <laughs> <laughs> I think I speak on behalf of all our viewers. We're glad you didn't this time. That's excellent. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Very good, Peter. So, last question for me then. What, really, what are you most looking forward to as, as we sort of transition back to normal? Uh, continuing to stay on the right side of the grass. <laughs> At my tender years. <laughs> Excellent. Seems like a good idea to me. <laughs> Very good. So... I'm actually quite keen, we're quite, quite keen to get back and uh, see some rugby and Saturdays haven't been the same, have they? Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Certainly yearning for it right now, aren't we? Yeah. Hopefully not too long to go. <laughs> Good stuff. Thanks, Peter. So uh, next time on the Cockroach Cast, we'll be taking you further around the globe than we've done before by catching up with New Zealanders, Richie Kircher and Max Hoynick. Uh, we hope you join us again. That. Uh, but for now, though, I'm Jason Thompson. He's Michael Maudsley, and thanks to Peter, it's been great fun finding out your your experience at Northern. Uh, we trust you, you and your family are staying safe, and, and hoping it's not too long before you're going the touch lines again. Cheers. Thank you very much, Peter. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Good see to you. see you.